This video was made possible by your support on Patreon. I want to show you something. This is where I got my first concussion when I was 15 years old after a bike accident. And I remember it well. After I peeled myself off the floor, everything started spinning around me. I felt like I was in this fog, and even though I was under this canopy of trees, everything was blindingly bright. And I have had other concussions since that one, but I don't remember them as well. So, what is a concussion? According to the American Academy of Neurology, it's any biomechanically induced alteration of brain function, typically affecting memory and orientation, which may involve loss of consciousness. Basically, it's everything that happens to your brain after you hit your head. Now, concussion symptoms usually resolve with time, but after one concussion, it's easier to get another. And enough blows to the head put you at risk of a permanent and progressive brain damage called chronic traumatic encephalopathy, or CTE. If you've heard that phrase before, you probably follow the NFL. The National Football League started dealing with accusations that they'd known about the risk of concussions to their players for all this time, and they were covering it up for some reason. And that brought about a bunch of other problems, like what happens to the NFL if nobody's buying tickets because they feel guilty of what's happening to their favorite players? What happens to Pop Warner if now parents don't want to sign their kids up for football? This became known as the concussion crisis, but calling it a crisis wasn't really fair. That implies that this problem snuck up out of nowhere and that the athletics community is only just now responding to it. But as we'll see, it wasn't as much of a crisis as much of a decades-long story of our treatment of mental illnesses, breakthroughs in science, and the origins of modern sports medicine. Scholars have been researching concussions since antiquity, and they do a great job of citing the work that comes before them. Hippocrates usually gets credit for the first description of violent head injuries, but the Persian scientist Al-Razi made the distinction between the big head injuries that killed you and the ones that caused temporary changes in brain function. Then in the 16th century, an Italian physician proposed a mechanism of concussion. The squishy brain banged against the firm inner part of the skull, resulting in physical damage. While they were right, the modern concussion story starts in the late 1800s with the most basic question. What is a concussion? Let's set the scene. Part 1. We've got to start somewhere. If you had a mental illness in the late 19th century and had no one to care for you, you might have been taken to a mental institution, often called an asylum. These were less about treatment and more about keeping people out of harm's way, and they were getting popular. In 1880, the United States had 40,000 people in institutions. By 1900, that number was 250,000. But this amount of asylum patients allowed doctors to get more data about head injuries than ever before. One of the first big moments was in the 1870s, when James Crichton Brown gave us two big insights from his institution. The first was that concussions were incredibly common, and they physically damaged the brain. The second was that multiple smaller concussions were really dangerous and could permanently change your personality. He was followed up in 1893 when another asylum scientist made the connection between head injuries and the psychological changes that followed after the acute symptoms disappeared. These days we'd call that post-concussion syndrome, but he called it a few other things. Traumatic dementia, traumatic neuroses, or traumatic hysteria. And these first observations were a big deal because, for the first time, we had found a potential cause-and-effect relationship for mental illness. They weren't just the way you are, they might be able to be prevented. So, asylum directors around the world started studying their patients, looking for cases of head trauma. In 1903, an American mental hospital director published a review that described the kinds of symptoms seen by patients in institutions. He had 49 concussion patients, and in 21, the concussion was followed by immediate loss of consciousness, in 16, by simple mental confusion, in 12, by dull pain in the head. In 19, mental disease began within one year, but in the majority, the commencement of the insanity dated from 4 to 10 years after the injury. In 14, suicidal tendencies were present. Weakness of memory and confusion of mind were not infrequent. The big takeaway was that symptoms varied from person to person, and patients didn't always lose consciousness. The year after, a British surgeon noticed that any severity of concussion could cause symptoms, and patients with mild symptoms rarely sought treatment. In a lecture, he said, I refer to those very mild forms of concussion in which loss of consciousness lasts a few seconds or may be practically absent. Such cases are rarely admitted into hospital, and the apparently trivial nature of the injury usually leads to entire neglect of treatment 
or to treatment of an entirely inadequate kind. Thus, it comes about that grave consequences are more liable to follow the slighter forms of concussion. T.C. English, Hunterian Lecture, 1904. So by the 1910s, we knew that concussions caused physiological brain damage, that multiple concussions had a compounding effect, and that even mild concussions caused problems. Still, all of our observations came from a specific population. All of them had been institutionalized. But it's 1914, so you know where this is going. Part two, the 20th century. We have no idea what we're doing. The world wars produced thousands of head injuries through gunshot wounds, collapsed tunnels and debris, and close proximity to explosions. And while many soldiers presented with both psychological and neurological injuries, it wasn't the golden research opportunity it sounds like. Doctors could not find a solid link between explosions and psychological symptoms. Was it the head injury or the stress of war? This was also around the time that Freudian psychoanalysis was gaining traction, and psychoanalysts were often used as general physicians in the war, since so many soldiers presented with psychological symptoms. PTSD, or shell shock, being the most well known. That introduced a new definition of trauma into medicine, mental trauma. While no serious scientist said that concussion symptoms were entirely psychological, the rise of psychoanalysis made clinicians question how much of shell shock was from physical trauma and how much was mental. After the first war ended, head injury research focused on industrial accidents while psychoanalysis continued to grow in popularity, especially in the West. Then in 1927, Two neurologists from New York, Michael Osnato and Vincent Gilliberti, dropped an absolute bombshell of a research paper. They showed that structural changes in the brain caused mental disturbances, and they called out their peers who obsessed over psychoanalyzing head injuries. The trend of the neurologist's thought in this connection is apt to depend on whether he has learned to stress the psychological factors or whether, on the other hand, he seeks the structural organic causes. Our work shows that the structural factors in post-concussion neuroses have not received adequate attention. It was the old, if you only have a hammer, then every problem looks like a nail cliche. Psychoanalysis was popular, but it shouldn't be the only tool in head injury treatment. And they backed up their claim with evidence. In their research, Osnato and Gilliberti studied 100 people with head injuries, which were sustained either from work injuries, car crashes, or attacks with blunt objects. To be included in the study, that person also had to lose consciousness after the head injury. They were then x-rayed to check for skull fracture. They compared the symptoms to 100 cases of epidemic encephalitis, a collection of neuro symptoms that became more common after the war. And the symptoms were strikingly similar. Dizziness, headache, restlessness, sleep disturbances were all common in the concussion and epidemic encephalitis groups. But these were all subjective symptoms, and they wanted some objective numbers. So they looked for things that they could measure, from blood pressure to results from eye and ear exams. They also compiled images from other neurologists' collections to illustrate the pathologies of interest. At the end of the study, they urged doctors to rethink their treatment and diagnosis of concussion. They weren't just temporary things after all, and they did include some kind of structural injury. In fact, because so many of the symptoms lined up with epidemic encephalitis, they advocated for a name change traumatic encephalitis. Unfortunately, they couldn't say how it happened at the cellular level. Concussions weren't immediately deadly, so they were kind of stuck comparing symptoms while the patient was alive to brain slices under a microscope after they died. And that problem actually persisted until pretty recently. Concussions and their follow-up problems are subjective. Without the ability to visualize them, it's hard to make scientific progress. That's where boxing came in, a sport literally built on head injuries. In 1928, Harrison Martland published a paper where he described a condition like Parkinson's in a handful of boxers. He called it punch drunk, since the condition was caused by repeated blows to the head, later called dementia pugilistica to make it a little more sciency. Martland said that brain hemorrhages were replaced by glioses, kind of like scar tissue made out of glial tissue. That caused the brain to degenerate and symptoms to get progressively worse. Other people knew that boxers got concussions, but this was some of the first evidence that physical damage from repeated blows to the head caused psychological disturbances. He ended the paper with a story from a retired boxer, Gene Tooney. I went into a clinch with my head down, something I never do. I plunged forward and my partner's head came up and butted me over the left eye, cutting and dazing me badly. Then he stepped back and swung his right against my jaw with every bit of his power. It landed flush and stiffened me where I stood. That is the last thing I remember for two days. They tell me that I finished out the round, knocking the man out. From that incident was born my desire to quit the ring forever, the first opportunity that presented itself. Gene Tooney, New York Daily News, 
August 3rd, 1928. That personal and emotional conclusion helped make this one of the most influential papers about concussions in history. And even though he suggested that the medical community take this problem more seriously, there was no outrage or concussion crisis yet. Then finally, towards the end of the war, a physicist in Oxford named AHS Holborn had an idea. Concussion wasn't the result of burst blood vessels or skull fracture, it was a whiplash injury. When the skull hits the ground, a windshield, or a fist, the brain bangs against the inside of the skull, which damages the brain itself. This is still the model of concussion that we use today. Figuring that out meant we might be able to prevent concussions. And with World War II still going on, that meant safer cockpits for fighter pilots and better seat belts for car drivers. Going into the 1950s, we still had a few loose ends to tidy up, but for the most part, we had a fairly modern understanding of concussions. So could we call it a concussion crisis yet? Not really. The wars were over, industrial workplaces were getting safer, and boxers knew what they were signing up for before they stepped into the ring. The general public had no reason for crisis. But they almost did. The reason they didn't is because American football organizers did a really good job covering up their original concussion crisis, a century before the modern one. Part 3. American football's first concussion crisis. Football has suffered the worst PR in the concussion crisis for two big reasons. One, a lot of head injuries come from football, and two, the public is more aware of concussions than ever before. American football at the end of the 19th century was only an Ivy League thing, and looked more like rugby than a modern gridiron. But around 1892, people started complaining that football was too brutal and needed to be stopped. This led to colleges like Harvard, West Point, and Annapolis halting their programs, which then led to football fans rallying together to defend the game. And one man in particular wanted to see football survive more than anyone else. His name was Walter Camp. See, he was a living legend in football. He played halfback during some of the earliest collegiate football games ever, and went on to become Yale's team captain while he was still in med school. He also established a lot of the rules that made football different from English rugby, the game it was based on. Camp is the reason that football has 11 players on the field instead of 15. He's the guy who came up with the idea of possessions, first downs, and the position of quarterback. This dude was the superstar in early football. So at the end of the 19th century, Camp and all these representatives from different colleges like Harvard, Princeton, and Yale got together in New York to address some of those complaints and save football. Unfortunately, a one Dr. Pepper from the University of Pennsylvania couldn't make it, which is just such a shame. They decided to mail out a bunch of questionnaires to players and coaches so they could collect data and testimonies. Then they compiled their responses and published Football Facts and Figures, which was published in 1894. If you want to read it for yourself, I linked it in the description alongside the annotated script for this video. And wouldn't you know it, football was just the best sport in the world. Here's a testimony from an ex-player. I consider football one of the grandest games that is played. My experience on the football field has stood me in good stead and has taught me self-possession and the faculty of deciding quickly and accurately. I believe that in many ways it fits a man for the business of life when he comes in contact with his fellow men. I have been out of college for nine years, but I endeavor at every opportunity to see a good game of football. Yours very truly, W.S. Harvey. Now, this sounds like high praise, but according to a piece in the American Journal of Public Health, Camp omitted the part of the letter where Harvey wrote, The only serious injury I received was in the game with Harvard in 1883, when in a scrimmage behind the goal I was knocked insensible, but recovered in about 15 minutes. During the summer following, I was sick with blood gathering in the head and threatened with congestion of the brain, my illness being attributed by the doctors to the above incident. None the wiser, people cited this book for decades as evidence that football wasn't all that bad. Regardless, some things did change. Coaches stopped using momentum plays as often, plays intended to hurt the opposing team, and fouls became more obvious to the referees. Unfortunately, these reforms didn't have any effect on head injuries. A few years went by, and in 1906, the doctors from Harvard's football team released this damning report where they document the team's injuries from the previous season, including no less than 19 concussions and one death from head injury. The American Medical Association even chimed in to comment, Perhaps the most serious feature of these accidents is the number of concussions of the brain reported. Only two games were played during the entire season in which a concussion of the brain did not occur. There was a time when it was considered that convulsions and other untoward incidents of the unconscious life of the individual were not likely to be followed by serious consequences. 
This is not the opinion at the present time. Remember, by 1906, we had plenty of concussion research from mental institutions saying that head injuries had serious long-term effects. What made this report so impactful was how it spelled out just how common concussions were. So by the turn of the century, the medical community knew that head injuries were serious and that football players tended to get head injuries, but there wasn't a ton of progress in moving either public opinion or regulations. And part of that was because national attention was focused on other injuries that hit closer to home, like industrial accidents or factory fires, not sports injuries. And at the same time, football supporters reshaped the public perception of the risk by drawing attention to visible injuries, which were plentiful in football. If scientists wanted to influence public opinion, they'd need a way to prove the underlying brain damage visually. Unfortunately, the only imaging tool we had at the time was a primitive version of the x-ray, and those only visualized skull fractures, not soft brain tissue. The only other way was to do an autopsy. The other reason there was no crisis yet was the social reason. If we banned the big collisions, football wouldn't be football. Plus, the culture encouraged players to keep playing despite head injuries. Coaches told their players to man up and play through the next down. It wasn't reckless, it was brave. You weren't making a potentially dangerous and catastrophic decision, you had grit. For the most part, that was the routine for decades. Safety equipment got better and new rules encouraged safety, but concussions were always a serious threat. Multiple concussions, even more so. Part four, CTE and the modern crisis. So now we're in the 1950s and these storylines can come together finally. Football players were required to wear helmets at this point, but that turned the head into a weapon, which is the opposite of what they wanted. Plus, helmets were, and are, more for preventing skull fractures than concussions. Academically, we had a good understanding of concussions, and more experts went on record about the dangers of repeat concussions and CTE. In 1952, Harvard's chief of surgery, Augustus Thorndike, put out the idea that three concussions should be the upper limit before you quit football for good. Small aside, he later became known as the founding father of sports medicine with ideas like there should be doctors at every contact sports game, and doctors should be the ones who say whether athletes return to play, not coaches, which were radical ideas, I know. Then in 1955, a group of scientists started noticing tiny molecular changes caused by smaller sub-concussive hits. Sub-concussive is exactly what it sounds like, a hit that doesn't quite register concussion symptoms. The big hits were still worrisome, but the cumulative effects of smaller hits were starting to spook more people. In 1957, a neurologist named McDonald Critchley wrote a paper in the British Medical Journal that described what was happening with boxers' brains during chronic traumatic encephalopathy. This is also around the time we figured out that CTE was a tangle pathology. I'll explain. Our brain is made of neuron cells, which have chunky cell bodies and long axons and dendrites to send electrical signals around the brain. These neurons have tiny structures called microtubules that help transport different chemicals around the cell. There's a protein that helps stabilize these microtubules that scientists found decades after the study, and it's called tau. The tangles start to form when tau builds up inside the cell and interferes with cell function. You can see it in these pictures where the darker colored stains show tau buildup. To date, we still don't know a ton about how tau does this or how to clean up those tangles. Right, but back to Critchley's study, it reignited a controversy between the interests of sport and medicine. Was it a crisis yet? Getting there. The NFL wasn't on blast quite yet, but in 1994, they put together a committee to start gathering data about mild traumatic brain injuries. They published their results in 2006 and essentially said, concussions, no big deal. Sure, they can get back in the game if they have a mild traumatic brain injury. The NFL commissioner said that concussions weren't an NFL issue, they were a media issue. Sure, concussions happen, but the media was out to get them. It was fake news and he dismissed reports. Then in 2002, a retired football player named Mike Webster died of a heart disease, but friends and family had noticed intense psychological problems before his death. And those mental problems caught the attention of a pathologist in Pittsburgh named Bennett Omalu, who studied Webster's brain and made the connection to CTE. He published a paper in the journal Neurosurgery in 2005, which was the first time anyone had shown CTE in an American football player's brain. He published a case of another football player the following year, which started getting the attention of the NFL and the public. Representatives from the league called him a quack, said that he's got no evidence, and that raising the alarm was a terrible idea. But it didn't matter. Pandora's box was open and the public started worrying about CTE in American football players. Since then, more retired players have created a class action lawsuit against the NFL, but that's beyond the scope of this video. Regardless, we arrived. 
At this point in the story, we're finally at the modern concussion crisis. Part five, there is hope. Bennett Omalu's story was turned into a Hollywood movie in 2015 starring Will Smith. In the movie, there's a scene where his character drives by a local high school football practice, and he looks out at the players and we're supposed to feel his worry. These poor kids are gonna end up just like the deceased football players if they keep it up. But there has been some significant change, especially with youth sports programs, and that gives me hope. Diagnosis is still tricky for the same reasons, symptoms are subjective, but scientists are working on more objective, data-driven ways to diagnose concussion. When I worked in sports medicine, we'd usually send athletes with suspected head injuries for a CT scan to rule out any more severe, life-threatening injuries like brain bleeding. CT scans don't show concussions that well. But recently, scientists have started looking for proteins in the blood that are only released after a concussion. These kind of chemicals in the blood are called biomarkers, and scientists can use them as objective data for different conditions, in this case, concussion assessments. While they're not available in any doctor's office yet, the idea is that a simple blood test would be able to diagnose concussion and spot some of the smaller sub-concussive blows. On the CTE front, there's still no way to diagnose the disease before death. Coincidentally, Amalu and a team of other researchers have made some progress in diagnosing the disease before death. In 2018, they published a paper where they scanned a retired football player's brain with something called a PET scan and were able to visualize those tau clusters. When the player died a few years later, they autopsied his brain and confirmed CTE. So this might turn into something that lets us diagnose and treat people at risk of CTE while they're still alive. Finally, more school sports programs are using baseline concussion testing, something like the impact testing protocol. Usually this is some kind of computer game that tests reaction time, coordination, memory, things that are impaired during a concussion. I've personally administered and taken this test and it's challenging in a healthy brain state. I couldn't imagine taking it concussed. Either way, it's another data point we can use in keeping kids safe. Part six, is football bad? Our relationship with sports is complicated. We know they can be dangerous, but they're also part of something bigger. Sports allow us to share a collective love with a community of fans. People who might have nothing in common except geographic vicinity and the shared disappointment at the same team 10 years in a row. These communities built around sports have a strong place in our culture, whether it's football or softball, professional or middle school, or school or club. Participating in sports is risky, but sport itself isn't just risk, it's community. I wanna hear what you think. Will American football still be around in 20 years? Let me know in the comments. Otherwise, thank you to my patrons on Patreon. If you wanna support me and you're financially able, you can find a link to Patreon down in the description. Otherwise, have fun, be good. Thanks for watching.